Welcome to another sermon from the Lewis Church of Christ. And now, here's Adam. Glad you're here today with us at the crossing, and this is our last installment of our Heroes uh, sermon series for August. But I hope it's been fun for you. I know it's been a lot of fun for me getting to wear jeans and a t-shirt every Sunday. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun, but I hope it's been inspiring too. I hope you, you've been inspired by the fact that, that we're seeing ordinary men become extraordinary simply because Jesus is with them. Simply because they have the power of his spirit in them, they are extraordinary people able to do extraordinary things because of the power of Christ. And that same power is available to each one of us in Christ. And I hope you're excited and inspired uh, by that. This morning, like Chip said, we're going to talk about the Green Lantern. And I've already mentioned this to several of you last week, and you're doing the green who? Uh, he may not be as quite as familiar to you as the other three guys, superheroes, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Superman we've talked about. So let me introduce you to the Green Lantern. Uh, Hal Jordan uh, is, just like his dad, was a test pilot for Ferris Aircraft Company, uh, who always kept with the times as far as they were ahead of the curve with technology for flight. And he was a test pilot, and he was the best test pilot there was. He would push the limits as far as they and beyond where they could go, risking his life to do uh, what no one else would do. And because of that and his success, he was a little bit cocky. And then, of course, like every other story I've heard, something happened. And one day, uh, an alien named Abin Sur crash-landed on Earth, and uh, he was hurt, he was injured, he was dying, and so he transported Hal Jordan to him at his spacecraft, and he passed on his ring of power, the Green Lantern ring, to Hal Jordan. Now, Abin Sur was, uh, uh, was an alien. He was from the planet Oa, which is the headquarters of the Green Lantern Corps. 3,600 uh, these agents who are really like the sheriffs in space. They protect the entire universe. The universe broken into sectors, and Abin Sur was was the protector of our sector, uh, of the universe. Now, when a member of the Green Lantern dies, they pass their ring of power along, and so Hal Jordan became the newest Green Lantern. He didn't ask for it, he didn't want it, uh, he didn't have any, want anything to do with it, but the ring chose him because of his fearlessness and his desire for good to always prevail. In this incredible scene, Hal puts the ring on his finger and this bright light shines. And in that moment, he's transformed into the Green Lantern. Really cool outfit, cool mask, super cool ring. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was going to wear the mask and ring, but I decided against it <laughs> this morning. But so everything changed in that moment. He understood, all of a sudden he had the knowledge of the universe. He knew, he knew all about the Green Lantern's history. And in that moment, everything changed. From that point on, Hal Jordan was the Green Lantern in charge of protecting our sector of the universe. Uh, sector 2814, for those of you taking notes. <laughs> but maybe the coolest thing about the Green Lantern Corps is the Green Lantern Oath. And the oath you have to take to power up the Green Lantern that powers the ring, the oath you have to be willing to take uh, to be a Green Lantern, and it's one of those oaths and those things in a, in a comic book or, or more so in a movie that just make you want to be a Green Lantern. So I'm going to share it with you. And uh, <laughs> you have to say it this way, all right? So everybody, get your fist up like you've got a Green Lantern ring. Let's just do this. You can all be dubbed Green Lanterns for an hour today. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light. Ooh. <laughs> I, mean, I, got, I, got chill. I get chills a lot about Jesus, but I get chills about that because that's just cool. But did, I love that the Green Lantern's light was where the power came from. It was the light that always overtook the evil and the darkness. And it was, it was that light that empowered the Green Lanterns to be the protectors of all the people in the universe. The power was in the light. In Acts chapter 7, we were introduced a few weeks ago to a man named Saul. If you remember, as we, we were learning about Stephen, but the man Saul was standing along the sidelines cheering on men who were stoning Saul to death, or were stoning Stephen to death. That's, that's the Saul we were introduced to. Well, this Saul had a crazy encounter with light. 
And just like the Green Lantern, it changed everything for him. I want to share his story with you. It's in Acts chapter 9. I don't want you to read it. I want you to listen to it. I want you to let it play out in, in, the, in the video screens of your mind and just see how this happens. We're talking about Saul, this horrible person who was against everything Jesus. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? He asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up. Go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They had heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, Ask for a man named, from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, uh, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't this the guy who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And, and hasn't he come here to take prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. That's an awesome story. And, and here's Saul. We'll later know he got his name changed to be the Apostle Paul. So if I mess up and say Saul or Paul, same guy, same, same background, right? So here he is. He's still breathing out murderous threats against Christians. That's kind of his MO. He, he was a Pharisee. He was a rule keeper. He was proud to be against anything Jesus Anybody that, was, that followed his way, anything Jesus stood for, he was, he was good to be against it. Even here in Acts chapter 9, he's headed to Damascus to arrest any Christians, anybody who follows the way to bring them back, to put them in prison. But something happens on the way to Damascus. A bright light from heaven knocks him to the ground, and Jesus speaks. Just like Hal Jordan's encounter with the, with the light from the Green Lantern changed his perspective on everything, Saul's encounter with the light of Jesus changed his perspective too. And that's what I want to talk about today. I think, I think really Saul's perspective was changed uh, toward three things. The light of Jesus changed Saul's perspective of the person of God, it changed his perspective of the Christ, of Jesus. Totally new view on Jesus. Paul had been arresting and killing and persecuting anyone and everyone who, could, who had anything to do with Jesus until he encountered the light of Christ. Now we know, just from this morning and from previous sermons, we know what Saul was like. Listen to how his perspective changed about Jesus. In our story today, at once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. He grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. But he continued on. Listen to Acts chapter 13. This is Saul talking, Paul talking. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. Now he's, test Whoa. Now he's testifying to the resurrection. He goes on, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. 
Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. And he continues on his perspective on Jesus. Listen to this, Acts chapter 17. This is about Paul. This is how he's grown. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, three Sundays in a row, he reasoned with them from scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Same guy breathing murderous threats encounters Jesus. Now he's preaching about the Messiah. Acts 28, the last chapter in, in the book of Acts, Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, without any hindrance. Wow. When you're confronted with the words and the light of Jesus, you cannot remain the same. You're going to change in one way or the other. Something's going to change. Thankfully, change. Uh, Paul changed his perspective, and he went about preaching and teaching and proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. His perspective on the person of God changed. But that's not it. The Lord Jesus, the, the light of Jesus, uh, changed Saul's perspective on the people of God, on the church, on God's people. Saul went from persecuting, hunting down the people of God, to faithfully being one of them, and going all green lantern on them, and, and doing his best to encourage and lead and protect them. Paul visited so many cities in his days, and, and he was going there to lead them to Christ. And then he would write letters back to many of them to encourage them and teach them and, and lead them and protect them and warn them. The letters he wrote to the churches in Corinth and Rome and in Ephesus. The letters he wrote to the towns of Galatia and Philippi and Colossae and Thessalonica. The letters he wrote to young preachers to encourage them like Timothy and Titus and Philemon, they're all recorded as books of our Bible. So we could see just about how Paul was and what he was saying to these people. And he had this perspective of Christians was completely changed by the light of Christ. From, being, from them being an enemy and the ones to destroy to them being his brothers and sisters and the ones to help. I want you to hear some of the things his new perspective sounds like when he's talking to the people of God. Right? He was about killing them and arresting them and, and okay with stoning them. Listen to how he talks to them now. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Just reminding them who they are in Christ. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Galatians 3. So in Christ you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor male or female. You're all one in Christ. And he's just encouraging them, hey, you are the body of Christ. You have been justified and sanctified and redeemed. You are new. You belong to Jesus. And that's a good thing now. <laughs> he also protects the people of God. He, he, oftentimes we see passages where he's warning them about things. Listen to what he says to the church in Rome. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you've learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. And Paul's just saying, hey, I'm your big brother. There are going to be people there who are trying to lead you astray. Stay away from them. He's He's protecting the people of God. He teaches the people of God. He, his desire now is only for them to live God-honoring lives. Listen to what he said in Ephesians 4. Just, I need to teach you some things. Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. Stop lying. <laughs> Just tell the truth. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Don't let any, un any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. And teaching the people, he's teaching the people of God, saying, hey, you were once this, get rid of that stuff, you're new, now live this way. So many times we have a, we have a couple great prayers recorded in the scriptures that, that Paul's now praying for the people of God. Talk about a change of perspective. 
Listen to what, what his prayer is in Ephesians 3. Paul says this, this is my prayer for you, the people of God. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Isn't that an awesome prayer? To pray for the people of God. And there's Paul, not praying for himself. New perspective, I'm praying for the people of God, the people I used to persecute. Now I'm totally for them. All of these things from someone who wanted nothing more to destroy the followers of the way. It's an incredible change of perspective, and it's only because he encountered the light of Christ. One more way that Saul's perspective changed, the light of Jesus changed Paul's perspective of the purpose of God. He kind of tells us in Philippians 3 about this, this change of perspective. He says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, right along with the law, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, I was persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, perfect. I was faultless. Kept it to the letter. Basically, Paul was saying, hey, if you think you can boast in who you are, I can boast more because I'm the man. I was the greatest Pharisee. I was the best there ever was. I was perfect in all the law. I kept it the way it was supposed to be kept. I was the man. Look at me. This is great. But then I met Jesus. Look at the next verse. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, having nothing, having a, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Jesus. Saul's perspective on the purpose of God had changed. He was all about keeping the rules. I've got all the right credentials, all the right family heritage. I've got the right drive at work. Man, I am doing it. I am the man. Look at me. But after encountering Jesus, when Jesus shined his light into Saul's life and revealed the truth, Paul saw for the first time that what really mattered, what really defined success, he said, all this stuff I have, all this stuff that, that people think is great in me, all the stuff I've gained from the world, I consider it all rubbish. It's all garbage. None of it matters. It's all worthless when you compare it to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Saul's perspective on the purpose of God changed. Now he just wants to know Jesus, and he wants everyone else just to know Jesus. All the other stuff is okay, but it's nothing compared to knowing Christ, because that's what really matters. Jesus, it, it, this is really cool, this was all part of Jesus' plan. If you remember, I think I've mentioned it every Sunday of this month, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Right? Jesus says to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The very next chapter, the first week we study... Peter preached in Jerusalem. 3,000 were saved. We talked about Stephen. You remember after Stephen was died, the disciples were scattered, right? And they preached boldly wherever they went. Do you remember specifically where they, they said they were preaching? Judea and Samaria. Last week we looked at Philip. He, was, he preached the gospel of grace to the, the Ethiopian eunuch, and, and the Ethiopian went back and took the gospel back to Africa. Paul took the, took the gospel all over the region, all around the Mediterranean. I want to show you where he went. He took three missionary journeys that we know of, and, and he went all around the known, the known area there, delivering Jesus to many, many people. Check out this first one. This is his first trip. He took his first tr missionary trip, and, and, and he left Antioch, and he went to Derb, and then he came back. Two years he was out just delivering Jesus to people. You can read about it in Acts chapter 13 and 14. Look how far he went. This is a guy who loved to persecute Christians. Now he wants everybody to be one. The second trip, he traveled for three years. He left Jerusalem. He made this huge loop 
before coming back to Caesarea. You can read about that, Acts 15 and 18, the things he did, the things he said, the people he encountered. He's bringing Jesus to the area. Then his third trip, he went from Antioch all the way to Corinth in Greece, and then he came back to, uh, to Jerusalem. Four years he was out just bringing Jesus to people because that's what really mattered. Even after being arrested, while he was being transported to Rome, every stop they made, he was still testifying about Jesus because that's what really mattered. At the end of his third missionary journey, he's being brought back to Jerusalem, and he, he makes a stop near the Ephesian church, and, and he's talking to all the leaders of, of the church in Ephesus. Listen to what he says in Acts chapter 20. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what's going to happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are coming. They're facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. In Romans chapter 9, Paul even goes as far to say, as, I would give up my own salvation if, if my own countrymen would know Jesus. I love you all, but I'd never do that. <laughs> Throw that out there. But that was Paul's new perspective. Nothing else matters. It, it, it only matters to know Jesus. And that's a change in perspective that no one would ever have ever thought for the Apostle Paul. But this is what the light of Jesus does. <laughs> it changes perspectives. It changes the way we, we see things and we perceive things and everything is now new. We no longer look at people or anything from a worldly perspective, but from a spiritual, everything's spiritual. Everything has to do with Jesus, all of it. His people, Jesus becomes clear. His people, the church, they become our family. The purpose of God testifying to the good news of God's grace becomes our purpose. When we encounter the light of Christ, it changes us. I, I want to conclude this morning a little bit differently. I'm, I'm going to invite another superhero up here. Uh, I'm going to invite Chris Vicky up here, and many of you know him. For those of you who may not know him, Chris and his wife Emily have grown up in this church. They were the first couple married right here in this church. They're getting ready to have their first baby next month, Lord willing, not in this church. Yeah. <laughs> that would be very... Oh, I'm going to stop there. Um, but Chris and Emily, I want to invite Chris up here because he's a Green Lantern. Sort of. I mean, in a way. Go with me for a moment. Chris and Emily are missionaries to Tanzania, Africa. For the last three years, they have been in Africa working with Pioneer Bible Translators, an organization that translates the Bible into several different languages so that the people there can have the Word of God in a language they call their heart language. It's a language they understand and they speak and they readily know so that they can have the Word of God at their fingertips. And it's missionaries like Chris and Emily uh, today who are continuing that, that Jesus' plan from Acts chapter 1-8, bringing Jesus to the ends of the earth. But what you may not know is that, that Chris kind of had like a, uh, much like Hal Jordan, a Green Lantern, much like missionary Paul, had this encounter with the light of Christ that kind of set him upon this course of being a missionary. And, and I've asked, I want him to share that. Just tell us a little bit about that. All right. Um, I think anybody that is in a full-time ministry or full-time overseas ministry kind of can look back and see uh, things that were really formative in their lives that led them to that place. And for me, it's not nearly as dramatic as Paul's story of, you know, being blinded by the light. But when I look back and think about how I ended up, or how we ended up in Africa, um, I think maybe it started actually in the Bahamas, which for me, when I was 19, I had an opportunity to go live for a summer on a remote island in the Bahamas. It wasn't like a resort. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't really a, a fancy living conditions or anything, but I was by myself there. Uh, for an entire summer, and that was really kind of, I don't know now even why I went, but looking back on it, um, I think there were some important things that came out of that. There was a lot of time for me to be by myself and to pray. It's hard to imagine now, but it was before, there was no internet there, like before they had internet access, you know. In, uh, in you the, mean you actually had to bring room. a Bible? Yeah, and then, wow. <laughs> there was no phone. Wild. So there was, yeah, they have these books of paper. It's where there's pages. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, so I read a lot, I prayed a lot, and I had a lot of time to kind of think and reflect. And I, it was my first experience 
in another culture and seeing another, you know, the way that other people live outside of, it's, you know, in America, it's easy to get a sort of tunnel vision of what life is like. And uh, it was my first glimpse of the rest of the world, I guess right. you could say. And so uh, while I wasn't, you know, I wasn't blinded by a light there necessarily, that's probably where the light started to grow. Yeah, right on. And, and, and Chris came back totally different. His perspective had changed. In fact, um, before that, I'm just going to be frank, I don't think I ever spoke four words to Chris. I spoke many more than four words. Chris never spoke more than four words. He was very shy. He would never be up here. He came back leading worship. He came back speaking. He came back uh, just with, with, with a new perspective on things. And I want to ask you kind of like, because I've asked this question, that, you know, Paul was, God specifically sent Paul Go to the Gentiles. We, we don't want you to stay here in Jerusalem. We need you to go somewhere else outside of Jerusalem. And so, why Africa? Why PBT? Why not, why not right here? Yeah, I think um, I would have to answer why PBT first, and then I can answer why Africa. PBT is Pioneer Bible Translators. That's the organization we're with. And like Adam just said, we're, you know, we're all about translating the Bible uh, into languages uh, for people that do not have the Bible in their own language. And I first heard about that, you know, some, it was, uh, I guess, a few years ago now, must have been 2007, 2008, I heard about the need for Bible translation because a friend of ours joined this organization. And it was the first time I ever heard or ever thought about this, uh, this need in the kingdom. You know, there's many, many different areas to serve and many things. And for whatever reason, this just jumped out at me as, as something that, uh, that I wanted to be involved in however I could. And uh, you know, I'm an IT professional. I worked for quite a few years in, in the in the corporate world doing software development. And so it was unclear to me how I could, as a <laughs> as an IT guy, right. be involved in God's work around the world. Yeah. And when I heard about Bible translation and the technology that's being used these days with computers to facilitate and to uh, you know advance Bible translation, I thought, oh, this could work out. So. Um, we went to PBT, and, and at the time, uh, we, I guess when I first called, was just before Emily and I were married, and I said, you know, I'm IT, my soon-to-be wife is a teacher, uh, can you use us? And they said, yes, we need IT, we need teachers. And then, so to answer why Africa uh, is a little bit simpler, because we basically told PBT, uh, this is, you know, this is what we feel God has gifted us with, and we feel led to, to be involved, uh, so you just tell us wherever you want to go. Um, and they said Tanzania, and I said, all right, where is that? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Honey, where's Tanzania? <laughs> so that's why we went to Africa. Is, you know, that wasn't really like, we didn't spend a lot of time trying to decide, well, where do we feel like, where do we want to go? We didn't even scout it out or anything. They just said, we could use it there. And we said, we'll go there. So, so we said, yes. We said uh, yes. That's, that's awesome. Well, we, we just learned how Paul's perspectives change. It changed his, his view about Jesus, which he kind of touched on earlier, and his views of, of the church and, and the kingdom of God everywhere. I mean, it wasn't just in Jerusalem. It was, his, his view was changed. Everything's global. His, his, his view of, of his purpose. How's, how's God, how's, I guess over the past, since the Bahamas even, how has God really uh, changed your perspective? I think the first thing that comes to mind is after I got back from the Bahamas, I, uh, I got a, a really good job um, working, doing software development for a transportation company. And I sort, I sort of started um, down a career path of doing software development, IT work. And after a few years of that, uh, I, you know, I was pretty good at it. I had a, the job was very well paying, had a big house, car, um, things from, I guess, the traditional American perspective were going well. Yeah. But there was that perspective change that started uh, in the Bahamas continued to grow in me. And I had this frustration, this feeling like all of this work that I am doing, all of these hours behind, you know, sitting behind this desk, all of the effort, um, and all of the resources and everything that I'm putting into this is just to make money. It's just to wow. make, actually, it's just to make this company right. successful. Yeah. And then I get paid to do that. And everything that, all the decisions that were made, everything that we were doing, and uh, uh, everything that I was doing had to come down to money. Is, is this going to make money? Is this a good thing to make a successful company? And that really started to, to wear on me and wear mm. on my heart. And I think sure. God's spirit started to kind of move in me. 
to the perspective change that happened was this. It was, do I want my life to be about making money, or do I want my life to be about making disciples for Jesus? Mm. And uh, <clears throat> I found that for me, and I think probably for, for, for anyone who is, who is in Christ, um, there's a realization that can happen at some point that you will never find full fulfillment and satisfaction in life if your goal is to, to be, you know, to be rich and to make money. Right. Um, our satisfaction and fulfillment is only found in Jesus. And that was the perspective change that happened to me. It's huge. Well, the yeah. first one. The There's first more. one. There's yeah. More. Yes. How much time? To, not much. Your dad's itching to get back up here. Um, but yeah, and so I, there is much more. I, I would love for you to just to, uh, to spend some time, obviously, encouraging Chris and Emily, but in, have them over for dinner. Uh, hear some of the, the ways God's using them and has used them and has changed them. Uh, it's a powerful story. I've got one more selfish kind of question. Um, Chris and Emily, much like the Apostle Paul, uh, when they go into this culture, have, have, have accepted and have been a, become a part of the culture in Tanzania. In fact, they, they are, are, are nearly fluent sort of on the way to fluency uh, in Swahili, which is the native language there. And so would you, would you just say a short prayer over us in Swahili? Okay. That would be awesome. I would say let us pray, but I don't know how to let us pray. Tuombe. <laughs> I'm African. Okay. Tuombe. Mwenyezi Mungu, Baba, tunakushukuru sana. Tunakushukuru kwa kanisa hili na kwa neno lako. Leo tumeona Paulo, uh, tumeona mfano mzuri, mfano wa mtu aliyeenda, aliyeenda uh, kukufuata yeye. Yeah. Na na sisi sote hapa tunaomba kwamba sisi sote tutaenda kufanya kazi yako vizuri kama Paulo. Asante baba. Tunaomba katika jina la Yesu Kristu. Amina. Amina. <laughs> Amina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Lewis Church of Christ. We are located at 15183 Coastal Highway, Milton, Delaware, three miles north of Lewis on Highway 1. Our service times are 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday morning.